I guess when coming up with a concept for this talk, what I wish to uh, wanted to think about, I mean, there's different aspects of the art you can always talk about conceptually and uh, spiritually or whatever vein that you want to. What I wanted to actually talk about today was how my museum practice, the, the work that I place in public spaces, influences my commercial practice. Uh, here we have a piece habitat. Uh, my wife and I were fortunate about 30 odd years ago to, um, even longer I think, um, purchase a piece of property uh, on a lake. And um, I think it's very important. And uh, I think that uh, um, the area that you live in very much influences my work anyways. And so um, we were walking around the um, different uh, areas uh, around our property and the lake itself. And we would come across these interesting washed up pieces of wood that would uh, go to shore. And um, I would take the more interesting of these and bring them back to the shop and uh, place them in a corner of the studio thinking that uh, at one time that might be something that I would enter into my art practice. And lo and behold, uh, a pile of sticks as we see became my art practice. Um, this is not one of the first pieces that I did. This is a piece that uh, has traveled to various locations uh, um, in Canada, United States, and uh, been in, uh, but uh, it's one of the ones that I think uh, would would be be, be um, um, very representative representational of the, the, the work in its whole. I had one really uh, um, insightful idea. Um, again, um, nature is very much part of uh, what my art practice is about. And uh, cross-country skiing, Donna and I happened to come across uh, during the wintertime, the, uh, the lake, uh, the, not the lake, but the uh, swamp was frozen and I was able to come up to an osprey nest and not seeing it that close ever before, I was got to see how it was made and what it was, what it was uh, um, uh, made up of. And uh, looking at it, it, I was able to bring off certain ideas and then bring it into my art practice. Uh, this piece is, um, it varies depending on site. Uh, it either grows or shrinks. This is the smallest venue. And I, uh, here we have a piece that I've done uh, numerous times in very different colors and it's traveled um, to various museums. And then it started off being wood and uh, just gleaning these, uh, these material off the shoreline or actually uh, taking them and letting them dry out in the studio. But now they've progressed into being either steel or um, they turn or aluminum, whatever I choose what material to, to uh, work with at the time. And again, it's, it was shown in um, um, my, my galleries as well, my commercial galleries as well. Here we have a piece again, it's very similar in the same sh shape and scale, but it's more of like a, a sea urchin than it is a, a, uh, a number of objects on top of one. And you can see they're protruding from the center. And I think color for me is uh, very important. It's, um, it, uh, it has to be right in the, in the room in the sense that it has to feel right. I mean, um, color is one of the easiest things that I feel that anyone being with a, a, an art nature or not can come to and uh, immediately get a response, an emotional response, a, a visceral response, and an intellectual response off of all of these different uh, things. You, could, you don't have to understand uh, um, a field of uh, sunflower. You just have to feel the emotion that the uh, that the color, the field of the color, uh, actually uh, gives you. And then from that on, you can you know it's like a layering cake. You know you can del delve into it and um, in various things. Again, working with the same sort of idea and the materials, but come trying to come up with different. Uh, circle has always been something that everyone has touched here and there throughout their art practice and. Um, you know, and be it uh, on the ground, upright, or uh, large, small, just trying to feel, you know, how uh, it lives in the world and how it uh, 
uh, you live in the world with it because we do convey everything to our bodies, our you know scale of uh, of uh, the work itself. You you relate yourself to a material, be it wood or stone or steel, and you have um, um, you have a you have a, a, a feeling that uh, I can uh, pick up this this. Uh, core, uh, not cord, but a piece of wood. But if it was a stone, you make that assumption right away. So the thing that we do as artists is, you know, we use an artifice and we try to change the idea of what the material may say and give it another influence. This is a piece that's been out quite a few times at different locations. This is uh, at the Arbright Knox. It's a beautiful museum. Um, I was very fortunate years and years ago to be championed by them, by the uh, director of the museum. And we've done a lot of work with them and they've, uh, uh, they've been a springboard for me to do uh, various projects throughout uh, the, uh, the States. And um, uh, this particular piece started off as being uh, a wood piece that uh, would be up to I guess 30 some feet in height and varies, varies depending on where it is. And the last time we executed it was done in aluminum and it was for Linda Frum uh, in Toronto. And I've done a number of works for uh, the, the Frum family. And uh, I was very happy that um, Linda was, uh, was interested in purchasing and uh, installing this particular piece uh, into the blue. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, again walking through uh, the swamp in the winter time. You see, you know, these trees that are just left there, and they become very iconic and uh, very symbol of uh, the Canadian North itself. And and uh, essentially, uh, depending on where we where we live, we we get to see them in greater or lesser numbers. Um, here we have. Uh, thank you, Irene. Um, for helping out with uh, this project. Irene was uh, the art consultant on this project and um, it was a, just uh, both projects and it was just a, a, a special um, time to be able to work with her on, on this as well as uh, uh, the idea that we have something there in that uh, still um, is uh, received in such a way that I still have uh, people uh, corresponding with, with me on it uh, uh, today. And it's been there for quite some time. Um, yes, uh, double vision and double take, the blue and the red piece that you see, one was uh, an idea. And then the Irene came back to me with the, uh, the um, architect and uh, we talked about doing a, a sympathetic piece on the other side that referenced it and uh, um, hopefully we, we did it justice in, in doing it. Here we have uh, Angel. Uh, Angel again is a, a very, very much, this is a wooden piece that uh, again grows or uh, to different scale depending on where it was. It went to Athens, uh, the Olympics, um, with a number of other artists. I was fortunate enough to represent Canada to um, go to the uh, Olympics of the Arts. And uh, it was a great experience for um, my, my wife and myself and uh, got to meet artists from all over the world. And I think that was what I could take away from it is really, I mean, there was some great art, but really the, the um, the dialogue and the conversations and the time spent with the other artists for me was uh, um, what I uh, still remember and, and enjoy uh, um, very much so from that experience. Um, it's always nice when you're able to uh, work at a, a venue where you can have a number of artists working at the same venue so you can trade off ideas and uh, they, they, can, they can lend an ear to uh, um, different projects that you're working on. And so, um, for example, like this particular piece here, Angel has lived in various uh, similar uh, spaces, but um, then we ended up taking that particular museum piece and then moving it over into the studio. Here we are in the shop working away, and you can see the influence of uh, uh, 
angel within the, the two pieces that uh, Mark and I are working on right now. There's some wood pieces in the background. I think the studio for me is always fun because it gives you an idea of where the uh, artist goes to every day and spends the majority of the time. It's not really done in uh, having lectures or, or uh, um, exhibitions. The majority of the time is spent really uh, you, with your partner at home or in the studio itself. And I think um, the studio for me is always interesting to see the, the this is as clean as I've ever seen the shop. Mm -hmm. It's never that clean. It was done just for this particular uh, series of shots that we are doing. So uh, um, just to give you an idea of the space, and uh, this is one of the studios that uh, I've worked in. Uh, I'm still in this particular area, the studio here, uh, but um, we uh, we end up there. We have a finished product for the ones that we're working on. You can see the 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 transition in the sense of the material speaks very much for uh, the uh, transition in the regard of the sticks have an organic quality. And as you can see in this particular uh, image, uh, it's these are more industrial feeling. It feels like the uh, materials been manufactured, but uh, I did end up uh, starting off and then working with a, a hammer. And uh, uh, here we have another one, a little larger in scale. But again, the transformation of uh, from organic and to off the shelf um, uh, materials that are uh, then trans transferred into the studio and then the artifice of actually coming together and trying to have a relationship between the the, the work that is uh, that I'm putting into the public spaces in the museums and uh, my, my um, larger monumental work and then bringing it back uh, and, and having to have a, a common dialogue between the, the two of them. Here we have a, a, an organic piece again. This is wood, uh, I believe it's ironwood. Ironwood is a wood that is uh, essentially doesn't get any larger than about four or five inches across in the, in the, uh, um, the wood. And it's usually a garbage wood, but the settlers would use that because it was readily, and as, as, as you say, as I say, it's iron wood. It's very, very strong. So they would use it for implements, be it a, um, a hammer, a sickle, hoe, whatever it was. It, it didn't last very long unless you cured it and oiled it, but uh, it was very strong and it was readily available. So uh, it was used quite a bit. And here we have a, a another piece. Uh, this one is at the uh, Brooklyn Botanic uh, Garden in um, uh, Brooklyn. And uh, um, this is site specific where we went into, I was artist in residence there for a, a period of, uh, I think three weeks, four weeks. And uh, this was material on hand that they had cedar. And so I brought material with me, but essentially, um, Again, we're in a botanic garden, so they don't want us really cutting any of the trees down. But over the course of uh, years, they would actually take trees uh, down that have lived their life, and and uh, then they would uh, store them in certain areas. And so I was able to access the um, the uh, I guess the uh, storage grounds where they would keep materials, and uh, essentially uh, it would all go back to nature. It would be either pulped up or then go into a, um, a compost. Um, again, here we are moving back to a piece. You can see how it relates to, this one's about 100 and, 100 and some feet high. I can't really do the math on uh, But um, this was a, a pleasure to, to, to work with the architect and um, the uh, designer, um, art designer that was actually coming up with uh, some of the ideas. I actually made this particular model um, for them. And then, um, as you can see, this is Tableau, and it's on, I believe, uh, Richmond and, and John Street. And uh, we were just uh, spitballing and talking about how, you know, how it, we would like to integrate the work within the building itself and how in the, uh, the, these models that uh, the architects have built are worth 
quite a bit of money and they're very beautiful in their own right. And uh, we had an exacter knife. And as we're discussing the piece itself, the uh, um, owner, the project manager, actually got the exacter knife and cut a hole in the actual model itself. And we placed the sculpture in because the sculpture we thought was was essentially going to either go to the outside of the piece or underneath it, but not. I never came up with the concept at that particular moment of bringing it through and integrating the two of them. And we're uh, we. This is what happens when you have a, a, an amazing team that you're working with because you're able to, on the fly. Uh, um, there are no limitations. Uh, there is a, a, a way of actually. Um, overcoming uh, the, the diversities and problems and, and having no uh, parameters was exciting in that project. And so we cut a hole in the center and we placed the work in. This is the first uh, piece that we uh, did for them. And they are they also, also echoed it in all the, the buildings themselves and the elevator. The piece was uh, mirrored and the uh, on the flooring, they, they used the idea of, of taking the uh, piece and moving it. Here you began from my museum and, and public work back to working with the galleries. And here's a, a piece that's in the same vein. Uh, Full Tilt is a series that I've worked on and off for a number of years. And this is at the gallery right now. Um, in its various degrees, I use DOM drawn over manual material, which is uh, has no seam. It's uh, here. This is a, a same idea, same piece, full tilt series. This is at the embassy in uh, Prague, um, and uh, again, um, very much. Uh, taking my art practice, changing it up a little bit, but hopefully there's a common thread, a reference to uh, all the work that I've been doing because you don't want to jog off too far off of the, the idea unless there's a, you can come around and, and, and look at the uh, uh, common thread between uh, uh, each piece and each series. Again, more commercial work, but it's an idea that I was working on and you can see this rep again, reflected and represented in the piece that I did last year for the work in um, Quebec City at the Biennale at, uh, in Quebec. And that was a, a, a wonderful time. Uh, Don and I had a spectacular time. We've never been to Quebec City in wintertime, and, and it was out of this world. We got snowed in uh, uh, for a period there and it was pretty spectacular time and this piece is quite large um, these are actual split rails I've used these this material a number of times the split rail fences around been this probably 110 115 years old and uh, gives you a bit more scale uh, in the piece um, the actual first uh, cherry picker that we got was too small so we had to actually wait for uh, half a day to then deliver one because uh, it's hard to see there. I should actually have a shot of us working on it to get more of a scale. But uh, yeah, it's such a pleasure. The split rail again is something that we, as we drive through the, the country, we, we, we tend to uh, see it and it becomes in, um, very much in the background. But it's a, it's a beautiful um, uh, Canadiana, Ontario aspect of our countryside that I am um, I truly uh, um, uh, cherish. Uh, here we are again back into a museum, working with the idea, coming up with a similar one to, but but trying to bring in an, uh, an element into it that is more industrial in in, in the um, and that's uh, in, into the work itself. And that sometimes either is uh, is successful or not, and that's something to be determined. I think hindsight. Uh, is great, but uh, essentially you do have to go in and actually work in these venues and execute the work and then digest it to get an idea. But out of that particular work came this commercial uh, work that we've uh, done in San Francisco. And uh, that went in um, 2015, I believe. And uh, it's over 50 feet high and it's again in the full tilt sort of vein series, um, trying to get that organic quality, but using industrial materials. And in this sense, these are tapered poles uh, and then using them in various degrees to 
uh, come up with a concept that, and again, you're not just coming up with a, an idea and and sort of uh, that's that's in the white box. You have to work with uh, the uh, the art consultant, the architect. All all these people have a, a vested interest in um, what you're trying to create so that it works. So because it's not just within the moment. Hopefully, the piece actually. Uh, has something to say to generations going on and is relevant. And so it has to work within the place that it's placed uh, with uh, nature or buildings or... Uh, and, and what I try to do with uh, the work that I'm doing is a, a different concept, but trying to bring a little bit of nature in, into an urban setting. And here we have Blizzard here, and uh, Blizzard is a piece, you know, the idea came from me. We, we all have had this driving through the wintertime, and uh, the snow is coming at you, and you actually get snow blind there. And uh, this this particular piece has traveled across Canada through the states and, and different venues, and it's, it's uh, as you can see, it's quite a large piece. Here's a side view of it. And you know, the idea of it coming out of the wall, the idea of it coming at you, you, you can view this uh, piece uh, and I, I, I like, again, this is all wood, but um, it could be, it was, uh, depending on the area, it grew or shrunk, depending on the, uh, the venue that we, we seem to, I, I seem to find myself working with. And that's worked out before I go away to the gallery, because you, you only have a, 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 a museum, you only have a certain amount of time to execute these works so that uh, you're not wasting your time. And uh, of course, the... Um, um, the docents and the uh, um, art, um, art directors. Yeah, directors and everyone else's uh, um, time. So, you know, you, you try to work them all out for the actual uh, um, set itself. And then here it's in its permanent home in Calgary. Um, we did this particular piece. It sort of shrinks in scale, but uh, you, can, you know yourself that from actually seeing the side view of it, that it is pretty monumental in the space itself. And uh, um, yeah, it was a pleasure to have the piece permanent home. And uh, uh, you bring again, you're in, instead of having a lighting fixture or something inside a, um, a, a space like that, I mean, uh, we have a piece of art that hopefully speaks to you time and time again as you're coming in or or if you're seeing it for the first time it has that awe factor hopefully and uh, here's a piece that uh, i did a number of years ago and i did i believe i did three of these and i have one in the studio that i've just finished and executed and um this this uh, uh work is in um, transition in the sense I'm, I'm not sure where I'm taking it, but I still enjoy working on the series. And it's it's almost like we're listening to uh, a collector earlier talking about a painting that she has collected, and she wasn't sure if it was the same painting or not. Well, at least they're different sculptures, but it's in the same series, and you're still working out the idea, the initial, the kernel, the idea that you honestly have and you're working through that until you hopefully it comes to a fruition and um and uh, here we have a a piece uh, again it's an organic piece it's traveled down to the southern part of the states to uh, across canada and i've shown this in various settings and scale and very simple i mean we have people that uh, tend to um you know uh, um look at a piece of driftwood and they on the shoreline or somewhere and they tend to uh, pick it up, drag it home and either put it on their lawn or in their house or uh, in their garden. And again, that's an abstract shade. It has no reference to anything. It has a, an emotive feeling that, that people tend to, you know, drag home and the, the, the most individual that has no idea about abstraction actually would drag a piece of uh, driftwood home and then place it. I mean, you can't get anything more abstract than a hunk of driftwood, and yet they're very comfortable with it. 
They can relate with it. They relate with the material. They can relate with the, the shape itself, the history of the, the, the material, the wood, and so on and so forth. And then you take something by just painting it a, a color and placing it in a, a various shapes and direction, you, you, you can't... You, come up with different concepts and different ideas that, and everyone generates their own ideas from looking at this. And yet hopefully I can, um, you know, in, inspire someone to come up with some other ideas. Um, th again, this is the first time I did this particular piece. It was uh, at uh, Carlin's in the sculpture uh, um, garden. And uh, we did it with uh, telephone poles. And I quickly found out that telephone poles are very heavy <laughs> and they're a lot of work. So uh, we had that one for a number of years uh, at Carlin's and it was, uh, um, uh, it was more linear at that particular time and, and a mound quality to it. And so what happened then is that uh, as you're working through these ideas, it, it transpired through all different types of, and this is cedar. Cedar is a lot lighter than, than uh, uh, pine. And it's, uh, you get it in various different degrees, which is lovely to work with. And it stands a test of time. Cedar objects that have been outside for uh, years and years, and as long as they're treated with uh, a little respect, um, they, uh, they tend to weather on. Uh, it's a beautiful setting. Uh, I worked as a, at there as a, at the, Sculpture. Now you can see from this one here, it's a little, it has a, a, a different quality feel to it. It's the same material, uh, pro, uh, lesser, more material in the sense of um, the individual uh, sticks themselves, not sticks, actually the logs. But uh, you can see this one's squatted, and, and here we have one that's a little bit more linear and it's a lot taller in scale and a little bit more material, but this is a, a permanent piece that um, the Arborite Knox has purchased and it's uh, uh, now in their collection. And again, moving it over, here I am in the studio uh, working on a piece and this one um, will be red and it's again, it's, it's an industrial material off the shelf, DOM drawn over mandrel, uh, it's a little taller now than you see it. That was uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm just going to uh, take it up to the powder coaters and it's uh, going to Carlin's Sculpture Garden uh, in the spring as soon as the uh, weather clears up and we're able to get the, the um, different machinery in there to place it on the, the, the pad. So again, in the studio, I like the studio shots. It's just wood leaning up against the wall. And that's pretty clean too for the shop. Um, again, industrial material, and it changes. Um, this particular piece I'm very fond of. Uh, a number of years ago, my wife and I, Donna, and I were actually driving through Prince Edward County, and we saw this orchard and all these trees, these apple trees, had been knocked over. And I was quite, uh, wow, how did this happen? Was there a hurricane, a windstorm? And I talked to the uh, gentleman who owned the uh, orchard, and he said he was actually paid by the Ontario government to take trees out of uh, uh, commission so that uh, they would keep the price of the apples at a certain price. And uh, so I'm just talking to him on that, but I got to see the actual gnarl and all apple trees at that particular time, the older ones were actually grafted onto be it a Spartan, Macintosh, uh, uh, whatever the, the, the type of apple that uh, is um, um, being grown, uh, what would happen is, is that they would put the graft on and from this came this gnarl, this, this object as you can see up close, and there's two different types of wood here. So you would have color and wood itself is beautiful in its own right. But again, uh, I, I, I just stripped the bark off on these things, sandblasted them, and they have a quality of hearts, organs. Uh, they have a quality of, uh, of or, or it has an organic, but you know you know their wood right away. You, you relate to them, but multiples of anything is, is quite interesting and fascinating, I find, too. They, they tend to uh, um, you know, have an optical illusion as well. And again, I brought those into uh, the series that I did Critical Mass a number of years ago. And uh, you can see I use those gnarls uh, and with 
with different branches on them to actually connect and then give this this object this uh, these these different objects I should say and combine them and they come become something you know very interesting and actually I was very thrilled these uh, people came in uh, during the course of the uh, setup of the exhibition and um, you can go online and there's a dance performance that goes with this and they actually made costumes and it looks like Cirque du Soleil that they, these costumes are unworldly as, the, as the, uh, the work itself has that quality again. You can see the gnarl again at the top and then the branches coming off and give you a little bit of scale. And then we have the museum aspect of it where it's... Uh, been exhibited and then I tried to bring that how somewhere into my commercial aspect and uh, this is something I executed uh, uh, this winter and uh, sorry this last spring and um, I was very happy to uh, I feel this work works for me uh, you know we have something that's resolved and it's, it feels like you've nailed it well, I, I'm very comfortable with this work, and uh, I'm very. I feel that this work is is speaks to me, and hopefully speaks to uh, um, um, other people out there. And I, I really enjoy the, the the quality of these these works. They work as a grouping or individually, and uh, uh, it is for me museum work in the sense that it will hopefully stem stem the pass of time. Um, again, just a close up, and it, it it doesn't look like so complicated, but that's the joy and the excitement about doing some stuff is that stuff that doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very very simple, and yet as long as it says everything it's supposed to say, it works. And hopefully, this works. Uh, again, commercial spot. This is in a hospital. Um, and a vascular hospital, actually, and so that, and so that was something that, uh, uh, you know, maybe that was a little liter literal for the uh, uh, our consultant in the sense, but uh, work the piece, I love it. Um, it's very strong in the sense of with the lighting, and it works with the building itself. You have a very clean, uh, organic, uh, industrial-looking building here, and then you have this organic quality of this sculpture here. So, yeah. and here we are in Ottawa, and uh, we're installing a, a piece in Simon's uh, retail aspect um, in the Rio Center. And uh, I love these people. I mean, it's a Canadian company, a uh, success story in the regard that it's been a uh, families, uh, generational families have uh, worked with this. And um, every store that he uh, in, uh, actually executes now and brings into the public, he commissions a Canadian artist to do a piece of art for it. And I was so fortunate to be one of those artists. And here we are having installed. It's quite a large piece. And what the idea of this particular one is that, you know, it's a frozen moment. It's a moment that, you know, it, it, we have uh, somehow this, this gaping hole in the middle of the, this building here. And we have a frozen moment of time where the, this material, these uh, branches, these limbs, these these uh, wood pieces are falling through the hole, and uh, yeah, it, it, uh, still there. It's hopefully it'll stay. Uh, it's a lovely piece and great people to work with. Uh, another shot of it from a different angle. Um, again, it's ironwood, um, all locked in place. Critical mass uh, piece. Uh, this traveled quite a bit. Again, you're taking an organic thing and. You're trying to bring it into a setting, um, pretty much the white box in the galleries. You can put pretty much anything in there. It looks pretty spectacular in the regard that it's clean. It's uh, your whole focus is on it, but um, to greater to greater or lesser degrees, um, the work lives and dies uh, uh, for me in, in, in its own. Um, space and it changes for each one. Here we are in the shop working again. Now this isn't my shop, this is uh, 
a shop that I worked with for over 25 years. It's George Wright and Son. They're in Kingston here. They're, I started off, uh, it's three, four generations now. Started off as a blacksmith shop. And uh, this is Core 10. Core 10 is a great material. Um, I made, uh, uh, this series was a commission that we uh, worked on. And then I, I still enjoy it. I still love doing these pieces. And here we have it again in New York. Uh, this particular piece has traveled to uh, various uh, settings. The last one was at Carlin, and now they're in Tennessee. Tallahassee. Tallahassee thank you. <laughs> Tallahassee, Florida. And okay. Yes, Carlin. I'm going to ask a question. Um, somebody's asking a question here on the side. It's an interesting question. As you work with different media, uh, whether it's wood or steel or cortent, um, do you work with different apprentices uh, for each of the media, or do you have a stable of artists or of apprentices that you work with? And I just want to say, before you answer that, um, we have the sculpture garden uh, application process every spring and uh, every winter, and people apply. And about 50% of the people who apply to show work in our sculpture garden say, I was an apprentice to Shane Dark at some point in her <laughs> resume. So I'd be interested to hear about your assistance. Well, um, I guess what it is essentially is that uh, you take that word apprentice and it's very liberally used, I guess. And some, uh, I always uh, encourage uh, either wannabe artists or artists in their own right to come into the studio and we have a conversation and out of that, <clears throat> some end up working for me and some, some end up just coming in on Sunday or Saturday and sweeping the floor and having a conversation with me. So uh, they, again, they're very liberal with the, that. Um, I always, I don't have anyone working with me at this particular time just because of what's going on in the world. But uh, I do always have uh, people that I work with um, in various capacities, be it an assistant or be it a professional welder or a professional dye maker. So yes, we always have a, a staff on hand. We don't at this particular time, uh, just because of what's happening in the plant. And um, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I think it's part of what you do as an artist is somehow to uh, uh, give back. And I was not uh, uh, trained through uh, normal procedure. I, I just had a love for the arts and ended up, uh, um, I guess, uh, finding my own way through it and taking different courses. And uh, at a stage, Donna and I uh, bought a house and moved into the country. And I was luckily uh, moved beside David Pickering, who was the sculpture professor at Queens. And up until then, I was doing a little bit of sculpture, but a lot more uh, drawing and a lot more painting. and. Uh, he sort of was, got me my, uh, essentially, I, I gleaned information off of him, and he became my uh, mentor. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do now is I try to mentor other artists or wannabe artists. And I think that's something we can do um, without uh, uh, um, too much effort. I mean, it's essentially, I have to work with people. It's part of my practice. I'm not like a... Uh, an artist that works in a studio by themselves and does all the research everything else. I work with the groups of people. So uh, if, if I can bring in somebody and uh, pay them uh, a, a wage that allows them to um, work in an art setting, I feel very fortunate that I can mentor these people for a period of time. And Essentially, they're not, they're hired to be fired, I think. They're all like, I'm like a baseball manager. You keep them for a while, and then they go off and have their own life and their own art practice, because when they're working with me, they're doing my art practice. And uh, um, so, uh, essentially, they're here. The Pete has been working with, I've been working with Pete for about 25 years, and he's the only person that, and he's a welder. He's not an artist. I like that in the regards that, I don't have to have a dialogue with Pete in the sense of uh, why I'm doing something or how I'm doing or, or why I'm doing something. I do have to have a conversation on uh, 
how to do something because you know it's the, the industrial aspect of the, the working with the materials is, is in, in, uh, in the world and making them safe and uh, um, is, is what I have with Pete. So yeah, and that's it. I just left you with a pretty shot of uh, some of the work that we've done and and uh, handing it back to Carolyn. So okay, was... now I've got a, there's another question here. Um, Millie is asking questions um, about spires, um, that it seems to be a major shift to something that has the potential to have a symbolic reference. Mind you, I would say the drop stones also have that. Um, but um, you talked to me before about that sort of iconic Blue Mountain, the Lauren Harris, the Group of Seven, yes. the Canadian um, symbol yes. that's really probably at the heart of the country. So maybe you could talk about that. Well, uh, absolutely, Carlin, in the sense of we don't grow up in a vacuum. We, so you're, you're referencing different artists, you're referencing your history, you're referencing your country, or all these different things are part of the dialogue. And, and you know, uh, this work is, you know, essentially it's the material that I use and it's linear, like I'm using. Uh, and, uh, you know, Group of Seven were a big influence on uh, an awful lot of us, uh, in our art career, and it was some of the first work that we saw um, in uh, your, not even art class, just uh, within the, the class itself and around homes and such. And I'm not talking about originals, of course, but Lauren Harris was a big influence. He was one of the, the uh, group of seven for me that had a abstract quality. So I tried to, you know, nothing, again, is, is, is in a vacuum, you, you glean different ideas and hopefully you make them yours. And by bringing them into your art practice, you're still discovering, like I've done, this is the fourth one that you can see in the shop, and I will be doing more of these because I haven't finished with the idea. And I think I can add something. It's like, like I said earlier, a layer of cake. You keep trying to layer on top of that, on top of that. And and out of that, hopefully, that's there's a kernel of, there that's uh, exciting and um, a kernel there that is uh, uh, like the next one I'm doing at this is going to be about 17 feet in height and scale and also larger in the sense of the material itself but I'm trying to create a feeling for uh, people and, and uh, it's able I don't think it's a I think as an artist you know just because you're painting nothing but flowers your whole life, and then all of a sudden you turn around and you're, you start painting glasses and glass jugs and uh, pottery and such. It's not so much a transformation because I still have my palette. I still have the reference of, uh, of the years of, of uh, my own, um, uh, what I think of uh, as my body of work. That, that, and so you're trying to say something new. It's really, really difficult to invent penicillin. But all you're trying to do as an artist is to invent something like an aspirin if you're real fortunate, if you're lucky enough to even, you know, make a piece of art at the end of the day. And and so what you're uh, what you're trying to do is to make something new. You're an alchemist. You're trying to make something that hasn't been said before or say it in a different way. I hope that answered your question. Anybody else want to ask some questions? Oh, here's another one. Um, Irene, do you want to ask it yourself? Go ahead. Hi, Shane. Um, I was wondering how you determine what may or may not be made in additions. For example, if a client came and said they wanted windfall um, for a residential uh, scale, would you do additions or would you do another material? How do you determine that? That's, that's a good question, Irene. And I think what happens is that you really have to do a limited edition. It's not fair to uh, your gallery. It's not fair to the client. It's not fair to anybody if you do an unlimited uh, um, mm -hmm. Bateman sort of editions where it's a 
thousand on or something. So I I try to keep them uh, under seven. I think seven is the magic number in the regards to anything more. And even even when I am, I'm not it's not like print where I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm taking it and tweaking it and pushing it and pulling it to different. Uh, uh, direction so it has it's you can see it's definitely windfall you can see it's definitely of that family but uh not exact of so it's it's, site specific. it's site specific it's drawn that and you don't really want to do i've i've never done seven i think editions i've done maybe five at the very most and usually it's three or four at the most and part of the reason why is that sculpture is so difficult it's such a you know i'm not doing uh, i'm doing you know two or three pieces in a year i'm not mm -hmm. doing two or three pieces in a week and so when you do something twice you cut your time in half or if you're doing it three times you cut your time but you're not just trying to reproduce it because somebody wants the, that widget the exact same one you're trying to have that go out in the world and it is site specific and the patina may be different the scale may be different so there's very, all these variables going to play there thank you thank you shane somebody else is asking about the technical aspects of the bundled stick pieces um whether each individual element is positioned and attached individually or whether um uh, you're you're sort of constructing it in some other way. How does it work with so many parts? Well, the, the, given the, the, for example, the one, uh, if I'm doing one in uh, um, site specific that where the public is in, in, engaged in the actual piece itself, it has to be engineered. It has to be approved by the architect. It has to be approved murals. I mean, there's a contracts and everything is signed off on and everything has uh, a paper behind it. And so for example, Blizzard would be uh, one that we've executed so many different times in scale and color. And, but yet when it get, goes to a permanent place, it really has to have every T and every I has to be dotted, and and uh, every piece is wired together, and uh, it all has to be signed off on by uh, uh, not just myself, but uh, engineers come and actually view it after it's over, and uh, their reputation is signed off on it before and after. So yeah, there's and every detail is is in there. So uh, depending on the venue. Really. I mean, I would love to have work just leave it outside and let it dissipate and run away. I think that's quite an interesting aspect, but it's very hard for uh, a lot of people to purchase a piece and let it go away. They can do it with a garden, but it's very hard with a piece of sculpture or, or a painting or something. Um, they're quite fine with the garden to put it to bed and, and start afresh for the year. Thank you. Uh so another question has popped up. Um, how do you approach your exploratory process of an idea? Um, how do you, where does the germ come from? That's a good question. And um, yeah, uh, it could be a walk in the park. I and mean, it's so cliche. It could be a walk in the park or, you know, or it could be a, uh, you know, a, 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 a light going off in a room. Pow, and you get that idea and there's the idea. God, the execution is killing it. It's months of work. Oh my God. It's not like, you know, um, you can say so much with, you know, a gestural drawing, just a simple, that's, and it says everything. You don't have to say anything else. I would love to be able to do that with my with sculpture, but you can't. I mean, it's process, it's material, it's all these things come into play. Um, the germ of the idea. And all to make it look effortless, Shane. I'm sorry? All that work to make it look effortless. Yes. And sometimes it is the flashlight moment where you sort of find something in the darkened room and the idea, oh, there's your idea, flash, and it's there. Other times it's drooling where you're working it out day after day. You're getting little bits of it, little bits of it. And it becomes clearer and clearer, hopefully, at the, you know, as you're, and it, sometimes that takes, 
a moment and other times it takes years and, and half the time when I'm working through something, I'm never, I'm not happy. Well, I'm, as soon as the work is done, it's at the studio. I don't care. It's gone. I, I'm, I'm excited about it in the shop. James, may I, on behalf of everyone in this, uh, uh, this virtual lunch of ours, say thank you ever so much for sharing your time. That was really lovely. So thank you so very, very much. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it.